Nice background. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Keeping It Real uh, with David King. I also I want to start by saying thank you to Fred Silberf and Dave Ryan who are working our technical boards in the background today because uh, our original producer, Francisco, is out because he had his appendix taken out. We wish him a very speedy recovery, and we hope he gets well soon. So with that in mind, you know, last couple of weeks we've been having, we've had, you know, mayor candidate uh, Joe Gannam on, and we're going to continue that today. We have mayor candidate and a friend of mine, Mary Jane Foster. Mary Jane, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm very much delighted to have you. Uh, also, uh, you can reach us at our, you on our YouTube page which is keeping it real with david king uh you can watch old videos as well as new episodes of our show uh that are posted up there each and every week you also can give us your comments and suggestions what you would like to see on the show at our facebook page at keeping it at keeping it real tv which is the facebook page and you can give us your opinions uh, and what you would like to see going forward on the show and what you do and don't like about the show. Also, you also can reach us on our Twitter page, which is 13 Keeping It Real. Uh, yeah, 13 Keeping It Real uh, trailer. Ugh, I got tongue twisted. <laughs> but as you can see on the bottom of your screen, yes, that's our, our Twitter page. And you can uh, also give us comments there. And we also have a Gmail account at the keeping it real tv at gmail.com so we invite you to you know hit us up with all your opinions uh your likes your dislikes and comments on the show we're live so you can't expect that i messed up but Great. i apologize about that but going back to you mary jane wow i've known you for wow i can't even a while a while now yes but uh First of all, I want to say congratulations with you running uh, Thank you. to be mayor. Thank you. As you know, as you know, the city of Bridgeport has a lot of, you know, problems going on right now. Sure, a yeah. lot of, a lot of public safety issues for one, financial issues, uh, for another, and of course the ongoing issue with our board of education, and schools. But you know what? I would like to do. I would like to tell you a little bit about me because I don't think we've ever talked about that about our childhood and our childhoods and how you know life how I got here for mm -hmm. for as a for instance well I mean, we all know how we got here but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was actually born in Denver Colorado and I was raised by my mother and my grandmother um, my dad walked out on my mother when I was four my little brother was three my older brother was ten my mother used to say he left her with three kids, a dog, a station wagon, and all the debt, and took everything else, and that was pretty much true. So my mother put us all in the car, in the station wagon, we drove over the mountains, and went to live with my grandmother. And I was raised by my mother and my grandmother, who were two amazing women, really amazing women. In our house, there were only two rules. One, never tell a lie. Two, never make a promise you can't keep. Nice. And that, that was serious stuff. Nice. That was very serious stuff. So my mother went back to Denver to work as a shop girl in a jewelry store. And some Saturdays she'd close up the shop at 5.30 at night and drive over the mountains and spend Sunday with us. But otherwise she was in Denver working. So um, she decided that she could do it better one day. And she went out and raised the money to start her own jewelry store. And today my brother and sister-in-law have that jewelry store in Denver. It's still going. Nice. So she put me to work when I was eight. I've been working since I was eight years old. Since she's not around anymore, God bless her, we can talk about it. <laughs> yes, the child labor laws don't apply anymore. <laughs> but, and then it was smart. I mean, stop and think about it. My older brother took care of my little brother. I was in the back of the store. She could keep her eye on me. And I made both. So it was, it was all good. But I've been working pretty much ever since. I came to New York City at the age of 20 with $227 in my pocket uh, to become an actress. And I was an actress for 22 years. Nice. I did television, primarily te television and radio commercials. Things like uh, Mr. Whipple, Please Don't Squeeze the Charmin and Ring Around the Collar and 
all of those types of, of ads. So did that for a long time. And then I came out here. I met married a fellow out here. And I volunteered at what was then the YWCA, which is now the Center for Family Justice. Mm. And I was so blown away by the work that they did with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault that at 42, by now I was a single mother myself of two young kids, at 42, I decided to go to law school. So at 45, I became a lawyer and practiced law, working with families in crisis and, uh, and loved it. I remarried, and my husband and I developed the ballpark in the arena at Harbor Yard, which is how we met. Yes, that's pretty and, much how we um, met. We, the great thing about the Bluefish, is, apart from the fact that I love baseball and it's a whole lot of fun to be there, oh, definitely. Um, the great thing about that is that we created 200 jobs. And those jobs, we had job fairs all over the city, and those jobs went to Bridgeport residents. 90% of those jobs went to Bridgeport residents. We also bought all of this, our goods and services in the city so that those dollars stayed in the community as well. I think this is just an, a guesstimate, but uh, uh, just off the back of an envelope, I figured out that in about 20 years, the Bluefish have added $40 million to the local economy. So it's not the answer to everything, but it, it was a real help. And exactly. when we sold the Bluefish, then I went to work for the University of Bridgeport, and I've been there for seven years. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a very interesting story. I don't know if I'm going to be able to follow that, but... Sure you can. But definitely, uh, I know, specifically when it comes to jobs, you gave a lot of young people jobs, not just myself. Uh, you actually gave two others uh, with the disability jobs as well. Well, Ooh. I think it's important. You were all great employees as well. Well, thank you. And one went off to have a baby, and the other, he now works at Goodwill. But okay, it was an opening that you gave us at a time sure. where we never had work experience. You know, I, I've said it on the show before. I got the job, and, you know, for anybody that don't know, I got the job. Well, really, I, my mentor came in, got applications. We filled it out. We brought them back, and it was supposed to be, like, just for an experience. And then Mary Jane here went and was like, Okay, we did an interview, and she was like, we're hired, like, on the spot. And we're like, <laughs> right. <laughs> we're like, right. That's funny. So, I mean, you know, we. I were, didn't know that at the time. <laughs> and we're officially like, okay, now we're employed, employed. And our first, I never forget my first baseball game working there. It was 42 degrees. I was working at Gate oh, B, gosh. and it was like a wind and, tunnel. And at Gate B, <laughs> for you folks who don't know, Gate B, the wind just whistles through there. Oh. So, oh, it is bitter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you probably didn't like me a whole lot that night. <laughs> well, no, no. Actually, we did a lot because you gave us opportunity when most most people, especially with the disabled community, we don't get a lot of opportunities to have a job. And it was not really about that it was cold or whatever. It was about we had an opportunity. And sure. we wanted to make the most of opportunity. And so that would include freezing in 48-degree <laughs> weather. But that was, the, you know. You know, kind of our make our name and, and like, okay, sure. we belong here as well. And to this day, I still uh, work at the uh, Bridge for Bluefish, and I I've been there for about. Well, eight, you're a nine great years. employee. The Bluefish are lucky to have you. Oh you know, yeah, it was a sad day when, uh, you know, you sold the Bluefish and, and you went <laughs> on to UB, but you went on to do other great things. And now, with you running for mayor, I would like to see a lot of change because the mayor that we have in office now. We've seen taxes go up. In the last couple of weeks, we see the crime rate mm -hmm. shoot through the roof. Uh, and he's not telling us the truth about <laughs> it. Yeah, I mean, you know, going around making pizza parties instead of fixing what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, my question I have for you, and I'm sure viewers have at home, you know, what is your first plan if you should become mayor? What's your first plan to do when you, if, when you get in office? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, David, I think there are a couple of things that – absolutely have to be done. One is we have to get our arms around this budget. This is a mayor that just spends money. He just spends money. And then at the end of the year, in about March, April, he says, the end of the fiscal year, he says, mm, not going to make it until the end of, of our budget year, so we'll borrow some money. They, they do these TAN notes, these tax anticipation notes in every March or April. That gets us through until July. And then he says, oh, whoops, we're going to have to raise the taxes four times in seven years. So the first thing we have to do is get our arms around the budget and understand what kind of money we've got, where we can save, and where we can spend a little bit more. 
my guess is that we're going to find we can create some savings, and we're also going to find some bad news, too. But to your point about the pizza parties, this is a mayor whose office budget, the office of the mayor's budget, has increased 62% since he took office. He's got three different PR people working for him. Really? You know, it's unbelievable. So that's where, where savings can be realized. So I'd start first with the budget and understanding what we've got there. I'd then talk to everybody in every department in City Hall and say, what do you need? What are your strengths? What do you do well? What do you need help doing? How can I help? How can we make this better? Because really, the point of all of this is that we serve the mayor, all of the city hall employees serve the public. Right. So we want to make sure we can do the very best job that we can. And that is, that is where I, I would start. I know how to create jobs. You know, when, when we started the Bluefish, it was... Um, we were determined that we would only be recruiting in Bridgeport. You have to be disciplined, you have to be focused, and you have to be determined to find people who will do the job right and do it well for you. I happen to believe we have plenty of Bridgeport residents who can work for us. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable that the jobs that this mayor has brought to the city have not been for Bridgeport people. You look at the Echo Technology Park, his green sustainability stuff, you don't hear about Bridgeport residents working there. You don't see Bridgeport residents working in construction on Steel Point. That's very true. Until we give Brit jobs, Bridgeport jobs to Bridgeport folks, we are not going to improve our economy here. Right. And, you know, there's, you know, people, we need more jobs for one. I mean, like you said, the taxes are going up, and everybody that lives in Bridgeport are going through the struggle rather than selling their homes. I've seen more houses with a for sale sign in the front lawn mm -hmm. than anything else. And if you don't own a house and you pay rent like I do, you, you're paying more rent because, okay, you gotta pay taxes on right. your property, so you raise my rent, which makes it then it's harder for somebody like me or others who live in apartments to, you know, sure. make a living. And let's not forget, most of Bridgeport poverty is a big thing mm -hmm. here in Bridgeport. The majority of Bridgeport right. is poverty mm -hmm. you know i mean from the east side to the west side to yeah the majority of bridgeport is poverty and jobs is one thing a homeless situation is another thing mm -hmm. you know i think it's sad when you have you okay you invite people to come to your town and you have homeless people you know sleeping yes. on the street especially right downtown mm -hmm. which is the center of any town right. of any state well actually my my sticker today is from project connect homelessness Mm -hmm. And it was the 10th anniversary, and, and that event started in my church's basement, in United Congregational Church's basement. And it has grown unbelievably, and the last three years, we've hosted it at the University of Bridgeport. But my church became um, a no-free shelter last February when the weather got so bad. Remember, mm -hmm. it was two degrees, six degrees below zero. Um, and we, had, we put 25 beds in so that we could take people in off the street. They were going to die. It was just, it was very, very frightening. And it turned out, we thought it would be, you know, for a few days here and a few days there. Uh, our shelter was open every night for a month. Wow. So I volunteered uh, the 3.30 to 6.30 shift. And I can tell you, there is a desperate need out there uh, for the uh, many, many needs that the homeless have. But shelter is certainly the, the first one. Oh, well, definitely. I mean, you can't, you know, if you don't got a place to sleep, there's no way to get on your feet. Right. You right. know, uh, so that's the first thing. And then we have the educational system. I mean, personally, it's like World War Three to me with the educational system. Yeah. I mean, it's such I a mess that I don't even that. know where to start. I know. You know, and, and the it sad was, part remember, is. Remember, it was just four years ago that the mayor failed in his little conspiracy to have the state take over our board of ed. And that was, remember when he went up to Hartford just after the 4th of July and said democracy didn't work in Bridgeport? Didn't really matter if we, did, if we lost our vote, if we didn't elect our representatives for the Board of Ed because, you know, we were all immigrants and former felons? Really? So that was, that was the start of it. And then when he lost that round uh, in the state Supreme Court case, um, he tried to take over the, the board with a charter revision, and he lost that. 
So then he had, you know, a control of the Board of Ed, and we had Correct. Board of Ed elections, and that changed. I don't always agree with every vote that everyone takes now on the Board of Ed, but you know what? They are a group of people, with the exception of one, who are actually talking through the issues. They are working through the issues, and they're coming up with the best solution that they can reach consensus on. Again, I don't agree with all of it, but I'm proud of the Board of Ed as it is today. Well, even inside the school system, I mean, there's, you know, there's never enough money for new books. Uh, the kids don't even have books to take home. I mean, they go to, they go to school and they come home with no homework, right. no books, no nothing. And the kids are like, well, I'm not learning anything. And then, you know, going back to poverty, the kids are like, well, I get a job, not in a good way, on the street, and I get right. a better, I'm getting more of an education on the street nine to five than I'm going to get in a classroom. You know, well, you, you know, have so many young kids today, they go, they're, and they're not even in school. They are literally at home. They are 18, 19, right. and they are 24 seven on the street instead mm -hmm. of being in the classroom. And they, and when you ask them, they feel because school doesn't help me, school doesn't care about this, school mm -hmm. only cares about getting paid. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's all about money and more money and more money. But then when, you know, you have those few kids that do care, the school always says we don't have enough money in the budget right. or we have to well, cut you know, programs in the school. This system. is a mayor who has underfunded the Board of Education budget three years, three different years. I don't understand how you're the mayor of a city. Every time you talk about the public schools, you talk about your children being in them. How do you underfund the Board of Education budget when your own children are in school? And I mean... We're, we're talking about, it's not just teachers and books and, and um, so forth. We're talking about all kinds of services, like guidance counselors, like exactly. drug counselors, the family resource centers. Our schools need more money. And, we, and I will tell you, I feel very strongly that, that we must elect a new mayor that the Board of Education and the superintendent of schools can trust. If the superintendent of schools knows that the mayor has got her back, that what she is aspiring to, what she is planning for, what she wants to provide, if the mayor has got her back, things will change. Things will absolutely change. As it is, this guy's got one agenda, and it's for corporate education, privatization of education. Yeah, and you know, and building. Uh, what do you call those new schools? Uh, uh, charter schools, I think they're called. The, well, the charter schools, and you know, I'm. I am not unilaterally opposed to charter schools, but I would not. I would absolutely support, and I supported a moratorium on charter schools in Bridgeport be, until we can fund our public schools. Right. You know, We have an obligation to educate our children. You know, a lot of people feel that the charter schools are like saying that my kid isn't good enough. Right. Because only a certain amount of kids can actually attend mm -hmm. charter schools. So it's like, okay, we're going to separate the, the ones that are going to be a success from all the others who right. they're not going to be. Or at well, least that makes the kids feel like, oh, I'm not going to be anything. You know, we, we made a yes. smart school, and then we made, mm -hmm. we're in this school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, the, the statistics across the country on charter schools are really mixed. They are not showing that they have a consistently higher level of performance. They're just not showing that. So, you know, if it, if it turned out to be, you know, the panacea, the cure for everything, I'd be very supportive. But we don't know what works well enough. In my view, I love the magnet schools because yes. it brings kids together from multiple communities. It teaches them in very particular ways. It sort of meets a child where his or her needs are and where their interests are. Right, and on top of that, the magnet schools, they do interact with the regular uh, population, you know, the regular school population, because I, I went to Central High School, and we had Central Magnet, mm -hmm. and then there was us that were part of the Central sure. High School. The funny part was, as much as they may sound different, we were all in the same school. Right. You know, <laughs> it wasn't, oh, uh, Central Magnet was just another school. No, Central Magnet was with us. It was just, most of their classes were upstairs, and, you know, most of us were, were downstairs, but electives like you know cooking class a gym mm -hmm, class mm -hmm. it, w it didn't matter if you were magnet or regular mm -hmm. you were all in you know gym class sure. together so it wasn't like well because i'm magnet i'm totally separate from you guys and that's why i like personally i like the magnet program mm -hmm. because it doesn't separate to say better or worse right it just you know 
just like anything, you happen to be, a, your education is a little higher, so, you know, you're a little bit more in advance on what they're going to teach. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't become a magnet student because right. if your grades, should, if you start regular and then you went up, you know, your grades went up, you can be a part of, you know, magnet sure. program. So it's not like, oh, well, now well, I got to wait. Well, it gives you something this. to aspire to, something right. to work towards. Right. So I definitely am all for the, the magnet school program, you know, but I just feel like a lot of young kids today, you know, you saw that's a, it's a to me it's a bad thing because they're the future. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm present. You know, and but they're the future. You know, you have a lot of kids that graduate, and I play graduate with quotes on it because right. they graduate, but they really can't read. But they have a high school diploma that says, "I'm educated." Right. You know, yeah, that piece of paper look good, but it's like they get flushed through the system, and then when they go out to try to get a real job, they can't even fill out an application. Sure, sure. You know, and when you go to the mayor with problems about this and that, it's like, oh, I'll get back to you, mm -hmm. yeah, and. and and this is one of the things that comes up when we come to election time. Now, they'll say, all year we'll get back to you. And never do. And then come election time. <laughs> I know time, where this is going. They'll knock <laughs> on your door. Yeah. And then they want you to get their, you know, vote for me, vote for me, vote for me. But this is why, especially with poverty. And then they say, I don't want to vote. Right. You know, the one thing, yeah, for any change, you have to get out there and vote. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter who you vote for. Oh, it's if so you important. Want change, you have to get out there and vote. But. You know, as the politicians, they have to, they can't make, like you said at the top of the show, you can't make, you shouldn't make promises that you can't keep. That's right. You know, you shouldn't promise the public that you're going to do something and never do it and then come election time looking right. for them to help you, you oh, know, sure. stay in You office. know, I've knocked on doors and people have said, why should I vote? You know, you're a politician. I'm actually not a politician, <laughs> but I'm running against two career politicians who have really never done anything else. And they make promises they're not kept. And people are out there saying nothing can change. Nothing can change. And so what we need to do is galvanize people and let them know there is an opportunity for change in this city. And, but the first step is that you have to vote. Hillary Clinton said this wonderful thing about if you don't vote, please understand that there are people somewhere else making decisions about your life and you had no voice in them and that's, that's not true. a place where any of us want to be that's true no, it very just it, it really isn't you know so i hope this election this primary which by the way is wednesday september 16th it's a different day mm. um because of the jewish holidays so it's wednesday september 16th i hope we'll see a real turnout because there's a stark difference real difference between uh the top candidates no question oh you know most definitely i mean you, I mean, you have, without a doubt, you have, it's a close race this year. It's a big talk all over town about, you know, who's going to be, who's going to be the mayor and when they become mayor, what are they planning to do? And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a big talk. It's like, a, it's like a fight. It's like a boxing match right now. <laughs> it is. I mean, for me personally, I, I just, no matter who does become mayor, I want, I want to see a different changing. I want, you know, I want the mayor to care. I mean, where I live in housing. We had a whole linky roof last winter, mm -hmm. and it was all over Channel 12 News. Uh, the mayor even came, and he was like, he's going to promise this and that. Never happened. And How did the roof get fixed? I mean, I, guess, I don't know. I mean, I guess after a while, they, you know, they did fix it. But, you know, there was, there was a whole issue going on. There's, there's apartment complexes with no heating in mm -hmm. the winter. Mm -hmm. People are using their burners, their ovens. Mm -hmm just to keep warm in the winter. Well, that, that reminds me of another issue. I was uh, up in Trumbull Gardens yesterday, knocking on doors and meeting people. And my heart and goes out, I'm sorry, you know, my heart goes out to all those who, in Trumbull Gardens, you know, lost their lives and their families sure. uh, that lost their loved ones. And I, I, met, I met the woman who was in her home when she was hit by gunfire. I met another young man who had been injured. He's still walking with a cane. And really, nothing has been done about the public safety issue up there. Oh. There is a very casual... They told me that once in a while, they see a police officer. Once in a while, they see somebody walk down the street. But there's not a constant presence there. Well, there's there not really hasn't cops been a response. There's not enough cops. And the well, cops that's are, right. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. The cops are, like, underfunded. Mm -hmm. you know, well, you know, or underpaid. Stop, or stop and think about this. 
we because we have so many fewer cops where's that money in the budget exactly we're not spending that money so we four years ago when the police officers pension changed we knew police officers were going to retire earlier and so this administration should have been planning to recruit police on a on a regular basis they didn't that should have happened community policing is gone in this town it just doesn't exist no matter what the mayor calls it it's not community policing community policing is when you have an officer in your community who works with the community who knows the community and is there on a very consistent basis we need to bring that back I can't believe that there isn't grant money out there to help pay for it but our and and then of course the last piece that we learned this weekend is that the mayor's office has told the police not to report on criminal activities huh? not until now, no crime uh, until after the election was the headline so I mean make sure I understand this folks because I'm about to just confuse you what you just said uh, so if there's any crime the cops can't do nothing about it oh they they can but they the mayor's office yeah reportedly okay asked that the police not issue press releases or videos that indicate there has been criminal activity so the regular flow of information I don't know if you noticed but we haven't had any press conferences on Trump uh, Gardens. No, we haven't. There was you're a right. murder at the market in March. <laughs> Nada. So, Zip. What, so what you're saying is, until after the election, we're going to hide all the criminal activity. Absolutely. To make it look because like everything Bridgeport's is fine. Getting better every day. <laughs> you know, I'm like speechless right there. I mean, I know. That, that's that's great. It's staggering. It's unbelievable. I have never in my you know I've never in my life, folks, heard that. I have been doing tv for almost three years yeah. i have never heard that well it it's just because this administration is nothing but a script a script that they follow they only you have to stick to the script it has to be good news and it doesn't make any difference whether it's real or not you just stick to the script and criminal activity homicides violent crime are not part of the script in an election season you know you're right i mean i tell people all the time i said you know if people see me every week on TV, I, you know, I don't have no hatred towards the mayor. My argument is there has to be change. You know, there has to be change. There has to be something to do, you know, with, to lower taxes. I mean, people are like, I don't want to live in Bridgeport. Anymore. I know. People I know. are like, I don't want to raise my kids in Bridgeport. You know, they're running out of here mm -hmm. and then they're running out of Connecticut. Right. And, you know, and they're quick to run down south. They're quick to run to Florida. Mm -hmm. And it's just sad. You know, I grew up in Bridgeport my whole life. And for people to be like, I don't leaving. want anyone to be here no more they're because leaving. of the taxes, because of the crime, because there's no jobs, mm -hmm. because there's no housing, because I, right. you know, it's just, I'm like, no matter to me who's mayor, when is it going, you know, when is it going to stop and when is it going to change? Right. And that's why. Well, let me you, leave you with one last thought. Okay. Who manages the budget at home? Hmm? Who manages the budget? Who says, kids, I'm sorry, we don't have money for those new, new sneakers. Who says. The parents. But which one of the parents? I'm going to go with mom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go answer. with mom. It's the woman in the house who manages the budget, who figures out how much money you've got, what you can spend, and what you can't spend. It's the, it is the woman in the house who says, you know what? I want everybody at this table. We're going to work it all out. We're going to come together, and we're going to move forward. So I would suggest, humbly suggest, that if you really want change in this mayoral election, you vote for a woman because women get it done. They govern differently. And I certainly will. But I want to thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. I mean, I really appreciate you coming out on the show and taking your, your time on your busy schedule, because I know you're very busy right now. Not uh, too busy for you. <laughs> to come out on the show. I mean, I personally, I will be out voting. So I will make sure my voice is be heard as I encourage everyone else to do the same. You know, you know disabled or not, you have a voice. And I, I even empower the disability community to get out and senior citizens to have your voice heard. Absolutely. Because, because we matter as well. Yes, you know? indeed. And, you know, so, you know, coming to the end of the show, is there any last words you would like to say? I just like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. You know, I'm not a career politician. I, um, 
I'm not as well known as some of the other candidates because I'm not a career politician, but I think this is an opportunity for an honest choice for change. Bridgeport deserves better. And I think bringing someone in new who doesn't have the baggage, who doesn't need the job, who wants the job so that she can do better by the city, I think it's a grand idea. And I hope I can get everybody's vote. I mean, for me, I just want to close out the show with saying, as usual, let your voice be heard. Don't be shy. Don't be scared. Because at the end of the day, the only one can make the change is you, for your families, for yourself, for your community. With that said, Amen. I'm David King. Thank you, Mary Jane Foster, for being on the show. Thank you. And I hope you guys have a great night. And uh, have a good night. Thank you.